Hi, my name is Chloe Heck. I'm an eighth grade student, and today I'm going to be interviewing Carolyn Wasser. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Glad to meet you. Me too. Um, would you like to tell me and my classmates who will be seeing this video um, a little bit about an overview of your job? Sure. Yeah. So um, I live and work on a 130 foot boat. Um, and that boat is used specifically as a floating classroom. Um, so in the pre-COVID world, um, we would have had fourth and fifth graders coming on the boat every day. And we would take them out, go sailing, and teach them about the watershed, about the history of the boat, teach them a little bit about, um, you know, the organisms they see in the water, about cleaning up the ocean. Um, but it's all about it's also about teaching them how to, um, you know, gain confidence and become leaders as they're on the tall ship. Um, so it's normally really, really fun. We're out on the water every day. And my job is um, typically either the mate or captain. I also uh, have a big role in the education of it and writing all the, the curriculum that goes on. Um, but in right now, because uh, we can't have 40 to 50 people on deck sailing with us. Um, everything is online and digital. Um, so right now my job is Zooming classes um, every day, teaching them about sea stars and echinoderms, and I'm acting as like a science teacher uh, via Zoom. So um, yeah, I'm captain, mate, education director of a 130 foot tall ship. So with COVID, what would like a typical day be like in your job doing all the Zoom meetings? Yeah, so um, luckily I have two other crew members that live here with me um, that are also educators. So we normally wake up in the morning and we have a little muster, a little meeting um, right around either eight o'clock or nine o'clock, depending on the day. And we sit down and look at our schedule and decide who's teaching what. Um, so I typically am better working with the younger kids. Um, so I will take any kindergarten lessons that we do. Um, Jonah and Daniel will typically take the fifth grade, sixth grade lessons that we do. And we kind of break it up. So we're each doing like one lesson or two lessons throughout the day. And um, when we're not teaching those lessons, um, we do have to maintain the boat as well. So part of our job is maintaining the boat. Uh, we have to make sure that it looks pretty when we have guests on board. We have to make sure it's not sinking. We have to make sure, you know, sails aren't going to fall on us from aloft. Um, so I typically do have more of an office admin -y job um, where I, I am writing curriculum. I'm, I'm normally on my computer 90% of the day. But Jonah and Daniel will often be up on deck painting, they'll be sanding, they'll be, you know, making the boat look nice, making sure it's not sinking, that it's good to go sailing. Um, I do get to do that occasionally, um, but, but because I do have a background in education, it's, it's more important that I sit down and write curriculum and be prepared to, to teach. So, yep, yeah, and then our day normally ends around four, four o'clock, five o'clock. We just do chores on board, do a, a big deck wash because um, it is a wooden boat and wooden boats like being wet. Um, and then, yeah, we're done for the day. And it is, it is a little interesting because I do live and work in the same place, um, but we do try to stop at the end of the day and then go into, you know, our typical typical life of just living on the boat, hanging out. Like that. Do you prefer doing most of your work on the computer or would you more like working on the boat? I don't. I would much rather be working on the boat. Um, I would much rather be sailing. <laughs> it's really it. I love being outdoors. I love being surrounded by the water. Um, so I'd much rather be out sailing with kids and being able to pull up sea stars and pull up like like sea sea lions and uh, all that fun stuff so yeah I don't really like being on the computer but um, I do have the skills and I feel like it is necessary right now to be kind of helping our organization um, you know navigate COVID and, and change our curriculum for that. Yeah um, when you like started working on boats did you ever like get like seasick or were you just like natural at it? 
I did. So, um, yeah, the first time I went sailing, it wasn't the first day I went sailing, but the first week I went sailing, um, definitely got seasick a little bit. Um, it is something that you get used to though. Um, after, you know, living on board for a couple of days, you don't feel that. actually really the, after the first day or two, you're, you're okay. Um, there are still days that, I'm working like up in our rigging about a hundred feet up in the air. And if there's big waves, I do still get a little seasick, but for the most part, um, I got used to it. Also our boats are made to like crash through the water a little differently. So you don't get as seasick as you would on like a big power boat. But part of my job is dealing with students that are seasick too. So <laughs> Um, often comforting them and helping them, you know, look at the horizon because that often helps us, helps people not be seasick. Yeah, I would probably be like one of those people who would be seasick. <laughs> yeah, normally the first like two hours people are seasick, everyone's laying on deck, not feeling well, um, but they, they get used to it and, you know, by that time we're normally at an island and ready to jump in the water and have fun. So, it's good. Yeah. Um. Do you have um, an exciting memory of sailing that has like stuck with you throughout the years? Yeah, I, this question was the one that stumped me out of the ones that you, you sent. Um, so I didn't start sailing until uh, college. So I don't have like a, a memory of myself sailing when I was younger that stuck with me. Um, I definitely like when I think back to when I did start sailing in college, um, there are just a lot of memories of being on deck with the crew. Um, it's just like sunset and everyone's playing instruments and we're all talking and somehow we're all strangers, but seem like best friends. And I often think of, of those memories and just like, oh, that's that's why I'm in sailing. It just like felt right. Um, so don't really have a big memory. I think lately, um, like there has been more memories that I know will stick with me. Um, I think that being an educator on board, when you almost like see what you're doing work, it definitely will stick with you. I mean, I've had conversations where kids come up to me and they're like, hey, you know, at school, I'm this like quiet person that doesn't talk to anyone and you just pulled me out and made me call sail and boss everyone around and you made me be the captain for the day and you know now I think I have the courage and I can like go out and have more courage at school and do this and I think those are, are definitely the memories that are going to be the ones that stick with me that I think you know what we're trying to do teaching the leadership and courage and getting kids excited about the ocean when that when that happens um, and the kids see it or I can see it in the kids those will be the memories that stay yeah I feel like that would be more of the most like, rewarding part of your job because exactly. you get to like help people out exactly exactly yeah we have a lot of people um so our boats are like in LA and there are so many people that live about five ten minutes from the ocean but have never been on the ocean mm -hmm. so we get a lot of schools that um, we're sailing with kids that have never seen the water before. They've never seen a dolphin before. And I mean, they're doing it by a big boat that looks like a, a pirate ship. Um, so it's definitely very rewarding. And I know the kids are going to remember it, um, you know, 20, 30 years from now, which is definitely very rewarding. Yeah. Um, so when you were younger, was there someone who inspired you to do sailing or was it kind of your own thing? Yeah, it was definitely my own thing. Um, so I thought going into college that I was going to be an archivist. I was going to be a historian and arch archivist, um, just working with papers, writing books, you know, being a nerdy historian. Um, and it wasn't until my junior year of college or something like that, um, that I I saw that this big boat in the Great Lakes was offering a history class on board. So basically I could go on board for a month, get three college credits, and they were all history credits too. Um, so the class was learning about the history of shipping and sailing in the Great Lakes on a boat. 
And um, basically you got there, you were at the dock for two weeks and then you were out sailing. And I was like, this is absolutely me. I am excited to go adventuring, like go to different ports, sailing something is something that's new to me. Plus I'm also learning about history. And it was, it was a type of history I was interested in. Um, I'm definitely more, I, I like transportation history, uh, the weird, weird one, but um, so I was really excited about the class, um, but then once I got on the boat, it was more like I was more interested in the boat and sailing than I was history. Um, I did continue my degree and I thought like, okay, well, I'll probably you know, still be an archivist or historian and then I just have this hobby of sailing. Um, but it just worked out that when I graduated college, there were some tall ships that were hiring that needed history educators. Um, so I I thought for sure it was just going to be like a summer of my time, um, but I loved it so much um, that I, I stayed. Um, so sailing, which I thought was going to be my hobby, and history that was my like was going to be my career, they kind of swapped. Um, so I still am very interested in history in my free time. I'm definitely like, oh, I should write a paper about this or reading historical books. Um, but history has become more of a hobby, and sailing's a career. I think that's kind of cool that you just like switch them like when you were older because like most people they know what like we're expected to like have an idea of what we want to be when you're younger. Exactly, exactly. I think that's definitely that's, that's one piece of advice. Like don't go into college thinking that you know what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, most people switch their major two or three times and then they get out of school and they're like, ah, but this thing's really cool. I'm going to try it. So just be curious and follow your interests and never let like a college path or a career choice determine what you do. Yeah. Um, did like before you went into college, did you ever have like a different job besides sailing or were you mainly just into history? Yeah, I was, um, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, so before, to be an archivist, I actually studied library science. Um, so I worked in a library for a little bit. Um, I guess I was in college. Um, so I was a librarian in college. I also worked as a history day advisor. So I spent much of my time in the journey room with Mr. Ashman. Um, but yeah, most of it was, I could, I could say that both the history day advisor and like being in a library were very much with the goal of being an archivist or a, a historian. Um, so I didn't really have any jobs that didn't have to do with that. Yeah. So yeah, I really just went right from history to sailing. Um, nothing else in between. Yeah, I know this is kind of off topic, but one of my friends who are in your class, she mentioned that you were actually her babysitter. I was, yep, <laughs> yep. I know all the Pizzolantes. Yeah. yeah. Um, You said you went to KU for college? I did, yep. Um, when you went into KU, did you already have like a clear path of like what you- what a, the, Of history? Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> no. Um, I think when I went into school, when I, when I was looking at colleges, I definitely knew I was interested in history. Um, but I mean, I grew up in the mountains and I loved hike. I love hiking. I love backpacking. Um, I was a, oh, actually I forgot this. I was a camp counselor for a little bit. <laughs> um, so I very much loved being outdoors. I loved out outdoor education. Um, so I thought that if I wasn't going to study history, it was going to be forestry or like environmental science. Um, so I, I would say my first year of KU, at KU, I didn't really know what I was going to study. The history was just like, I think this is my interest right now, but I could potentially switch to some sort of science field later on. Um, but I didn't. Um, I would say that my job right now, I am doing more science related work than I am history. Um, so that interest in forestry and marine biology definitely is a good thing, <laughs> was a good thing. Um, since you went to KU here and now you're in Los Angeles, I feel like that'd be a pretty big change. So how did you like decide to move all the way across country? Yeah, that, 
I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I had just graduated and I guess it was before I graduated, I started applying for jobs and I saw that there were three boats um, that I was interested in sailing on that needed educators. And I applied to all three of them and I, I think I heard from all three of them too. So I kind of had options of where I wanted to go. And I really just based it off of like my gut feeling. Um, the one was up in Connecticut um, and the, like I, I'm very familiar with the East Coast. Um, the, the program seemed cool, but uh, California, just like exploring an area that I didn't know um, was, was something that drew me here. Um, definitely a person that wants to explore new places and, and keep learning and keep, you know, traveling. Um, so that ref, that, that's definitely what kind of pulled me here. Um, yeah, I, it, it was a big switch. Um, I don't think it like, it didn't bother me at all. I, I loved it, especially like, yes, I live in LA, but I also live on a boat. Uh, and living on a boat is a really small, tight knit community, um, even like closer than Kutztown. Um, so I think it definitely works out. Like, yes, I'm living in a city, but I'm living in this cool outdoor environment with a really close community. So I love it. Yeah. Were you scared at all when you moved, like all your family and everything and your friends? I was. Yeah. Um, especially like a lot of my friends still live in Kutztown. My family's still in Kutztown. Um, but, you know, you can always travel. <laughs> you can always travel back. I see them at holidays. I go home about twice a year. Um, so a, a little bit. Um, it's kind of one of the, I guess I had like lived away from home for bits of time, but never like long term. So, so yes, definitely. A, am I going to miss everyone? Am I going to want to go back? But it turned out, it turned out like I love it here. So it's not a bad thing. Um, what do you like so much doing on the boats? Like, what's your favorite part? Mm, I, I have to say, teaching is actually one of my favorite things to do on board. Um, so typically a, a typical day, typical day pre COVID would be, um, students would come on board around 10 or 11 o'clock and they get on board. We do a quick safety talk and I do a little history talk about the boat and then we leave the dock. Um, so the kids are in the first 10 minutes of being on board, they are learning how the sails go up all with human power. They are learning how the sails are going to move us all with wind power. And they're helping us haul up these like hundred pound sails. And after that happens, after the boat is like, the, po the boat is put away, cleaned, we're sailing by the wind. Um, we, we stop and pause. And this is probably my, my favorite part of the sail. Um, and we make everyone be quiet for two minutes. And it's really hard for like little third graders to do that, but we have a moment of silence for two minutes. And then afterward, we have five minutes of curiosity time. So during that two minutes um, where they're quiet, they're looking up at the rigging and kind of like questioning, how did we do that all by ourselves? They're looking over the water and they're like, oh, this is the first time I've been surrounded completely by water. Um, they're seeing dolphins, they're, it's just a really cool experience. And then that five minutes of curiosity time, they're just like asking us questions, they're running around the boat, they're touching things, they're learning. And um, I think that's kind of my favorite part. Um, it's just like having people be curious and have wonder. Um, Cause oftentimes we don't, I think humans um, after a certain age, we just stop wondering, we stop being curious. We're like ready for people to just like lecture us and tell us what to do. Um, and our lessons are all based on that curiosity period that we have uh, worked into the day. And so we may be going onto the sail, like thinking we're going to be learning about watersheds, but if a kid comes up and is excited to learn about starfish, then that's what we're going to learn about. Um, so I think, I think my favorite part is really just like watching kids get excited and pumped about something that they're interested in learning about and knowing that that's something that they're gonna like carry with them the rest of the year or the rest of their lives. Yeah. So I guess like 
when you're planning what where you're going to do, like you have something that you want to do, but you can easily go off track. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so typically we work with the teachers and they either say we're going to do a science curriculum or we're going to do a history curriculum. So we know we know going into the sale that like this is the direction we're supposed to go. This is what we're supposed to be teaching. Um, but there's definitely time thrown in throughout the day where we can be a little flexible and the crew is really good at tying everything together that you know if people are interested in in sea stars we can eventually like tie that into fishing and the history of the boat um so it's just taking taking people's curiosity and allowing that to lead the programs yeah um you mentioned in your letter that on this one of the boats you were captain Mm -hmm. Um, how did you get there? Like, was there like a ladder? Do you have to work your way up? It is. Yes. So, um, there are two things that are required to get your captain's license. And the first one is sea days. Um, so when you sail, you have to write down each day that you went sailing and for how long you also have to write down where you sailed. Um, so you're collecting all these sea days. And then once you have an acquired amount of sea days, you can take a test. Um, And then that test, it's a series of tests um, that, you know, test your knowledge on sail and wind theory, tests your knowledge on engines, um, it tests your knowledge on ballast and the weight of the boat. Uh, So there's a lot that goes into those tests. Um, But then you take the test and you're certified. I guess you have to turn in the sea days too to the Coast Guard and and take the test and you're certified. And there are different levels of certification. Um, So like my certification allows me to um, drive a hundred ton boats. So pretty big boats, um, not the biggest, and uh, on near coastal waters. So that means that I can only go 200 miles from the coast. I'm not allowed to like take this boat across the ocean. Um, but the other captain who works here as well, he has a 200 ton ocean going license. So he just has more sea days, more experience um, on d- in deeper waters. So he, he can drive you know, he's a higher license. Um, and it is definitely something because of those sea days that you do have to kind of climb a ladder. So you normally start as a deckhand, just acquiring uh, those sea days, doing maintenance on the boat, going sailing. And then as you have those hours, you can get your mate's license, which is the same test, but you don't have to have as many sea days and then your captain's license, and then you can get higher and higher and higher captain's license. Um, so I've been working at it for about four years um, to be able to, to drive this boat. Did you know before you were going into boating, like how many things that you would like test on? Because as you were listing what you would test on, that's like way more stuff than I would have thought you would have to know. Yeah, I didn't know most of that stuff. (laughs) Um, but it does like, surprisingly, it is all stuff that you learn while living on the boat. Um, I mean, when you're out sailing and you have a crew of, we have a crew of four typically when we go sailing. If something goes wrong within those four people, you have to try to figure out how to fix your engine if it dies or, you know, if a, the boat leaks, you have to figure it out. Um, and so I think it, it, it's a lot of hands-on learning when you live on the boat. Um, I did, I think I did come into the industry with a few more skills than, than some people um, just because I do I've always kind of had an interest in carpentry and and fixing things. I grew up on a farm. Uh, So I think that definitely played in and and helped out quite a bit. Yeah. Um, You also mentioned that in your letter, you work on something called a tall ship. Yeah. And I had never heard of that before. So can you like explain to me what that is? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So uh, the, the company I work for has three tall ships. And tall ships are, the really simple definition is they're a traditionally rigged ship. Um, So that means that they, all of their sails, all of the equipment on board is as it was during the age of sail hundreds of years ago. So when we set the sails, we're not pushing a button to make them go up. We're hauling on them using pulleys and blocks. Um, 
if you Google it, you'll get a lot more of a discussion about it. They'll say that it has to have like a yard on it or some specific things, but really it's just like a big pirate ship. Uh, the rest of the world knows them as pirate ships. Um, so just something that is traditionally rigged and would have been used in the 1700s, 1600s for sailing. Um, and that those are the boats that we live, that I live and work on. Um, it's pretty rare that we actually sail smaller boats. Um, we do have a little fleet of like 10 foot dories, but for the most part, it's just sailing these big boats. Um, when you first started sailing on these big boats, were you like surprised by their size and like how you were ever going to sail one of them? I was. <laughs> I definitely was. Um, yeah, the first the first boat I ever sailed on was like 200 feet and I had no idea how it was going to work. And yeah, definitely very surprised. I still am pretty surprised oftentimes when I'm sailing, like this is a 200 ton boat. How are we moving it with just like a little bit of wind? Um, it, it's, it's pretty cool. I'm definitely still amazed and surprised. And I was just like, amazed that these boats are still around um that like despite all the engines that we have all of the new equipment all the new technology um these boats still exist there's like 500 tall ships in the world in the united states and there's even more overseas and i mean people still see the need to keep them around um but if you think about it technology will eventually die and the wind will always be here so they'll always kind of be relevant yeah, I think that's pretty cool that they're like an old fashioned boat and then you're still interested in them today, even though mm -hmm. we have all the technology. Exactly. And one thing that I kind of like fell in love with about tall ships is how much tradition is in everything you do. Um, so something as simple as um, like meeting your crew for a, a morning meeting, um, that is a traditional thing you would have done on board. Um, the, the way that we tie on the ladder to help us climb the rigging, that is all something that would have been like, that's the same way that a sailor in the 1600s would have done it. So kind of like, it's just like tradition being passed down, but it's not being written. It's just being passed down through this like small group of people that only know tall ships. Yeah. Yeah. With your work, it sounds like a lot of it is more like hands-on and more people related. So has this been like heavily affected by this pandemic? Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, so like I said, our typical day, our typical, our typical day during the school year would have been nonstop like education programs. So every day we would have had a different fourth or fifth grade class coming to the boat. So we would have been relying on sailing every day. Um, and I haven't sailed in about two weeks now. So definitely changed it. Um, we can no longer do that like hands-on learning that, you know, these boats were made for. Instead, we're switching over to Zoom. Um, so definitely heavily affected. That meant taking all of our curriculum that is, you know, our curriculum is supposed to like, students are supposed to have a sea star in their hand as they learn this lesson. And now I have to like hold the sea star up to the camera. Um, so definitely a lot of changes that we had to do. Uh, basically, we spent two weeks only doing curriculum development as we headed into the COVID school year, um, figuring out how to take our lessons, make it so we could do it on Zoom. Um, we did a lot of video making, um, trying to put what we normally do into videos so students could do it at home. Um, also, LA USD, all of our schools here in LA still aren't back in session. Um, so they are all still at home. Um, yeah, so so a lot of curriculum planning, a lot of figuring out how to take hands-on learning, putting it on Zoom. Um, we had to, you know, get Wi-Fi on the boat. That's something we hadn't had before. Uh, we had to get new computers so we could Zoom, microphones, a green screen, things like that. Um, so that has changed. Um, I think you asked some questions about the positions and if, um, if we were able to keep all of our staff. Um, we weren't. Um, most of our office staff had to leave. So um, our organization works where we have three boats and then there's an office on land that um, helps us kind of book the schools, um, normally helps us with curriculum development, um, does all the 
you know, admin, getting money stuff. Um, and a lot of those people left. So I did have to take on a lot more responsibility doing that work. Um, so I do have to write a lot of emails to teachers asking them like, you know, what lessons do you want? When do you want to book with us? What's your Zoom link? Um, we do have to do, I have to do website design now, um, updating our website. So it didn't just change like the way we teach. It also changed like the way, the whole structure of our organization really. Um, and so everyone is taking on a few more jobs and we're not just sailing. We're, you know, now on our computers a lot more. Yeah. And since you said you liked more the part where you teach the students, I guess it's like not defeats the purpose, but like it's more like the stuff that you like don't like to do because you said you more like hands on. So exactly. like off doing that. Exactly. Yeah. And there are definitely days. <laughs> um, I typically love my job. <laughs> um, I, I love it a lot. But there are de- there were definitely days during COVID where I'm just like, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't this isn't it. Um, where you know I've just been writing curriculum all day. I didn't interact with any people. Um, I'm a people person. I it, it was weird for me to only be talking to like the people that live here. Um, so yeah, definitely had some days where I'm like, ah, oh, I just want I just want people on board. I want to talk to them. Um, but I it would say the Zoom lessons do fulfill that. I I think that generally, um, generally people, I don't know, they're, they're, they're still learning and curious and asking questions on Zoom. So I, I do really enjoy our classes that we have. Yeah. Um, I had a few questions about like advice. So like, what advice would you give to like middle school students like me, um, like us going into a career or us following like what we want to do? Yeah. Um, don't ever have your mind made up. Um, allow, you know, follow what you're interested in, follow your passions. Um, even if people tell you that that's not where the money is, or that's a bad career choice, just, just do it. Um, show them that, you know, you can make it happen. Um, continue to be curious, continue to learn. I think that's a big thing. Continue to like keep learning. Um, you're never done learning. Um, yeah. And just, yeah, don't have your ma- mind made up about the career. And I think the big one that I, I mentioned in your, in the letter that I wrote to you is, um, you know, teachers want you to learn and they know that not every student learns the same way. And so be okay with asking your teachers to just do a different project because you have an interest an interest in the side project instead. Um, so just make your make your education like fit fit your interests and your passions uh, rather than just going this typical route that teachers have made for you. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people don't know that they can do that, so like they get bored in school and it makes it more difficult for them. So I feel exactly, like that's yeah. Really good advice. When I was in high school, actually, I took, you can make independent studies. So you can write your own classes and do them. Um, So I did a lot of that. I actually did a lot of that in college too. Um, The college didn't offer a course that I wanted. So I sat down with a professor and said, hey, I'm gonna do this class on the history of sailing. You're gonna be my advisor. I'm gonna write a paper and they they loved it. Um, and I think that employers also love seeing that. Um, they love seeing that you like went out of your way to follow a passion and uh, they know that you're then gonna do that in your job if you love it. So it's definitely definitely something I am pretty passionate about. Just like, you know, follow what you love. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, those were all my questions. So. Um, you taught me a lot and I learned stuff that I didn't think I would learn and I never thought that I'd be like interested in voting stuff, but it seems like pretty interesting. Um, so I really want to thank you for doing this and I really appreciated that you took time out of your work day to do this interview with me. Yeah, no problem. This was great. I like, 
This is a great project. I'm so glad Mr. Ashman's having you guys do this. I, your interview questions were great and I loved how like casual you were talking and you're very comfortable. So it was great meeting you. If you have any other questions, um, you have my email or Mr. Ashman has my email. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank yeah. you for interviewing me. You're welcome. I will be sending out a thank you letter later then. Okay. No problem.